Ladies and gentlemen, you're tuned into our exclusive interview series, Spotlight On, here on AfterBuzz TV. I am here with the extraordinarily talented Sean Brown. Don't move a muscle. You're tuning into the destination for TV superfan discussion, AfterBuzz TV. And now, let the buzz begin. All right. I love this. Sean Brown is here in studio with me, you guys. Sean, thank you so, so much for being here. Thanks for having me, man. Sean, let the people know where they can find you on social media if they Absolutely. want to follow your burgeoning career. Yeah, at I am Sean Brown, Sean with a U. Mm -hmm. uh, not that scene-ness or that Sean with a W-ness. It's I am, oh, sorry, and actually, I just changed it. It's just at Sean Brown. Nice, you're yeah. just, just, the, just the name just now. Just the name now. I've upgraded from I am, but now you should know, I guess, so it's just Sean Brown. You should know because Sean is actually a series regular on an upcoming network multicam sitcom called The Great Indoors. Yeah. It looks excellent. It's got a super talented cast, including um, Joel McHale and Christopher Mintz Plus, and we're going to get into it. Can't wait to talk about it. But before we do that, I'm Jeff Graham. You guys can find me on Twitter at Jeffrey C. Graham, and I can't wait to dive in to this discussion with you, yeah, man. Yeah, man, same. Um, again, I can't thank you enough for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, let's talk about your whole career, because okay. I, I have a feeling that Next year, you're going to be everywhere. Oh. Um, but where did you where did you start? Where were you born? Uh, well, I was born on March Air Force Base in California. I think it's about two hours east of L.A. Okay. Uh, and I was there for, gosh, I don't even know, probably less than a year. Mm -hmm. uh, then I moved to Panama uh, during the Just Cause War when Noriega was overthrown. Wow. And I actually remember as a kid having tanks rolling in the streets and the whole house shaking. Uh, then I moved to Layton, Utah, then I moved to Maryland, then Tennessee, then back to Maryland, went to school in Florida, moved to New York, and now I'm here in L.A. So you military family, I'm assuming. Military family all the way, yeah. 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 So how do you feel like that shaped you? I mean, obviously, as an aspiring actor, do you feel like moving kind of helped prepare you for roles? Or? Absolutely. Well, for, for me, it all goes down to like, you know, when you're starting over as a kid, you have to adapt, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And you have to be more personable and social. Uh, so you're not, you know, beat up or whatever, right. or just just welcomed into the fold. So I think that gave me the personality that I have now, which lent itself into my wanting to become an actor. Do you have any performance performers in your family, or do you feel like you were kind of one of the first? You know, my older brother is a rapper, nice. uh, a very talented rapper, and my younger sister is actually pursuing uh, acting as well. Okay, And very she's cool. now in school her first year at the University of Maryland uh, nice. pursuing theater. Very yeah. cool. Um, so when did you get started? What was your first kind of role acting, even as a child? Oh, man. I'm almost embarrassed to say. My, <laughs> my first thing I did, I, I, I played this man named Andrew Fowler, who um, it's more like a faith-based film. It's a true okay. story about this guy. And I played him as his younger self in a documentary. And I remember, like, I was supposed to be asleep. It was my first scene. <laughs> and my eyes would not stop blinking. <laughs> And they would be like, how do we how do we stop his eyes from blinking his eyes? <laughs> and I just couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, and then from there, I you know saw Hairspray on Broadway when I was 16, and that was what launched me to to become an actor. Okay, very cool. Yeah. So I was reading, you you haven't just done TV film. You've done a lot of theater. Yeah, theater was my was my base. That's how I started off. So where'd you start? Um, well, I I did you know community theater in high school. I was in West Side Story. Nice. I was the only black actor in the show, but I was a part of the Jets, which is supposed to be the predominantly white cast <laughs> against the. But they were like, "Listen, guy, you can sing and dance, and we need some more of you on this." Absolutely, like, yeah, that's cool. I got some lines. They uh, always need guys in those shows, you know. And, and and when you're in high school, it's like anything goes mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, so then from there, I went and studied musical theater in school and got my BFA in, nice. in acting. And then I went to theater and started pursuing Broadway. Okay, great. So you started in New York, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So what was your, what were some of your early roles in New York? Oh, I'm embarrassed to say this too. I, my first role, I played a mouse uh -huh. in uh, Lily's Purple Plastic Purse. Okay, nice. Uh, I, his name was Chester. Uh, he was a very cute mouse. <laughs> and then I went on to be a duck in the national tour of Click Clack Moo, based off of the children's book Click yeah, Clack yeah, Moo. Yeah. And then from there, I did a tour of DreamWorks Madagascar, um, and I was the understudy for 
all the roles, male, female. The swing, is that what I they was, call it? Yeah, it was yeah, the swing. Yeah. Okay, look at you with your lingo. You, you know. see, you, a lot of people don't know this, but I spent six months performing as a cruise ship vocalist, what? actually. So yeah, yeah, it was that, a fun gig. That's but, a hard gig, actually. You know, I we got lucky. I was actually in an, a quartet. There were four of us. Oh, nice. Oh, okay. I'm not much of a soloist. I was in an acapella ensemble in college, yeah. and then we kind of launched our own little gig. But You stayed on the, on the bass and the boob. Oh, no, boob. I'm flattered you think I was a bass. I'm like a textbook tenor, too, so I oh, can nice. I can sing like only eight notes total, you know what I yeah, mean? Because right, right. I don't have the high range that a T1 has, but I don't have the low range that a bass has. But yeah. the eight notes that I can sing, I can sing like super well. So. Oh, that's good, dude. I believe you. <laughs> yeah, I man. Believe it was you. fun. It was cool. But that, this is about you. This isn't about me. No, so. it's about you. I want to hear more about... No, but seriously, uh, I yeah, so I was on tour, and you know the tour didn't go well. We, we, we kind of bombed. Uh, Ma- this is Madagascar. It's Madagascar. Okay. Yeah, and uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg came to tell us, "Hey guys, we're we're closing you down." Oh no! Um, and then from there, actually, as soon as he told me the news, I went to my dressing room, opened my laptop, and bought a one-way ticket to LA. Good for and you, left, man. Uh, two weeks late. Like, two weeks later. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that sounds like that was kind of your step into the world of TV film. Mm-hmm. What do you feel like was the biggest adjustment? Be- as a theater actor in New York, transitioning to kind of an aspiring TV film career in LA. For me, you know, theater, you're playing to the back of the house. It's very physical. It's very mm-hmm. over the top because you want everyone, even the ones in the very, very far back, to know what you're, you know, experiencing. But for TV, like that close up, it's it's so simple, you know, and adjusting to that was so, so difficult. Um, but I guess it, it worked out. I guess I adjusted because I'm on this amazing show with this amazing cast. Yeah, and it is interesting because it's a multicam, and we're going to get into yeah. it. But there is an element of theatricality to a multicam. Absolutely. It's not, it's, you know, a single cam, it is a lot of the kind of close ups and subtlety. But I mm-hmm. think we can talk about it in a little bit. But yeah. I think with a multicam, there is kind of an element of being on stage. Yeah, absolutely. Which I'm sure is fun for you to kind of return to. Mm-hmm. So, what were some of your early, what, what do you feel like was your first kind of like, okay, I'm in LA, I'm. I'm kind of making it. Do you feel like you had a moment? Any specific shows? I'm kind of making it. Or were you making your own work? Because a lot of actors in LA nowadays yeah. are creating their own stuff, and that's you know, kind of how they... That stuff is really important. Mm-hmm. I never did that. Uh, but I still actually have the, the passion to want to write and direct my own shorts and eventually yeah. features and have my own production company. But um, no, I started off, man, I was doing commercials. I was a commercials guy. Nice. Uh, I My big one that, that was like, okay, okay, I'm in here now was a Super Bowl commercial for uh, Samsung. Okay. And uh, from there, when I had my big like theatrical acting break, I think is when I booked Newsroom as a recurring, and that's when I quit my job. I actually, on the floor, yelled out, I quit when I found out, <laughs> and I walked out the door. It's very dramatic. You're like, if this is going to be a moment, I'm going to make it a I TV totally, moment, man. I'm going to quit I my job. I hated that job. The job actually, the, the restaurant closed. It just closed down. Because After it was you such left, a, because you know, they, they couldn't me. handle it. No, it's funny. <laughs> they, they told us they were closing on Monday. It was Friday, and I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And then my agent called me and was like you booked newsroom as a recurring character and that's when i after having cried in the back room <laughs> came out and was like hey guys i quit and then i walked I out i love it yeah it was amazing so i should have done a little more research but was this season one of newsroom or had the show been on for a little bit it was season two okay cool. um it was when i don't know if you guys watch newsroom but it was when the mitt romney campaign trail was being yeah. followed in the opening i was part of the young journalists who were covering the campaign trail so did you ever get to work with Aaron Sorkin on the show? Or? I did. He okay, worked I want to hear about I'm a huge Aaron Sorkin fan. He so. was amazing. He worked really closely with us. And, uh, you know, the one thing that was kind of intimidating besides all the, you know, Oscars and, and Emmys and all that stuff, but he really knew what he wanted. Mm-hmm. You know, we had a director, but he was there to be like, hey, you know, you keep saying the and it's a. Wow. Yeah, he, like he was really, really specific. Um, but he was nice. Like he got us all Valentine's Day gifts. Granted, they were from Crafty and they were just lollipops. But <laughs> he was a really, really nice guy. And That's what I've heard. He was really hands on and very sweet. Not at all like the you know big powerful uh-huh. writer that he is. Right. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. It's from what I've heard of Aaron Sorkin, very friendly, very warm, but definitely yeah. knows what he wants. Absolutely. Like he. Yeah. He writes in a cadence because he comes from musical theater and theater background also. Yeah. So he knows how he wants a line to sound mm-hmm. yeah absolutely that is interesting as a theater actor too in general although it is single cam work mm-hmm. i do think there's an element of theatricality to aaron sorkin stuff as absolutely. well absolutely yeah he's uh definitely knows how to write yeah um, i mean he's he's doing all right he's doing okay he's, he's doing all right yeah I, I will say i think uh, two years ago i guess a year ago now steve mm-hmm. jobs was definitely one of my favorite movies that came yeah. out that year fast Man, that, performance that the 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 dialogue in that was insane it's insane. it just keeps like yeah 
Yeah, he's, he's one of the best, for sure. For sure. So what do you feel like was a big lesson that you learned on the newsroom? Because that was kind of your mm. first big, kind of recurring... Yeah. What do you feel like you took away from that experience? Um, Honestly, being like a good person and being the best actor mm -hmm. you can be will get you far. Uh, everyone on that set, granted, you know, it was a new show, so no one was at the time to be jaded and be like, oh, we're doing this again. But right. everyone was so great to work with. There was no diva. There was no ego. Everyone was like on the same level you know I talked to Jeff Daniels and he talked to me like I was his peer which was insane yeah. you know um, but that was for me like that watching them all be really cool with each other really cool with us who were just you know the, the lowly guest stars you know what I mean they could have been like oh, we're not gonna really get to know you but they really wanted to which was amazing yeah I'm glad to hear that I like Jeff Daniels a lot so I'm glad to hear he's a that cool guy in real life incredible um, so you mentioned that one of another experience you loved was um, your appearance on Grimm. Mm. Here at the network at AfterBuzz TV, our Grimm After Show is one of our most popular. So I bet what? some of these, yeah, people love our reviews that we do we cover here. So I'm sure yeah. some of the listeners will be familiar. Do you want to talk a little bit about your experience? I would on Grimm? love to. Grimm was an amazing experience that uh, we shot in Portland, which is where it's filmed. And first of all, that city is incredible. The food, a lot of coffee. The, the coffee. I, I'm not a coffee drinker, yeah. but I became one because sure, I, yeah. they were like, go to Stumptown. I was like, oh. All Right, we'll go to the stump, and it was insane. You know that um, all the food is organic and grass fed, so yeah, you know it's they, all and they, let you, they, and they let you know that too. <laughs> and they said, like, this is organic, yeah. Um, I'm but sure. it was crazy too because the hotel I stayed at, the chef was on one of those uh competition restaurant shows, like Top Chef or uh -huh. something like that. So they were featuring his food while oh, I was nice. there, and it was insane. But Grandma, the episode was where. You know, we're um, these kind of like ghost seeking team of, of um, young youth people, mm -hmm. and our, our buddy is electrocuted by this. Um, oh, what are they called? Those monsters? Polter, like what? What kind of the, monster? The the ones that change faces and they become the animal faces. Oh, like a. Um, oh, I'm such a I'm such a bad. I don't remember. Oh, either. but whatever that. Tell that us in it, the comments. Those who are tuning yeah, in. Yeah, please. What is the name of the I animal that, that we're forgetting? And, and like he shocks him, but it's tied in because we think it's a ghost, but we didn't see what it was. So it's us trying to find the answers as to how he passed. Nice. Uh, and it was a really, really dramatic episode, and we shot in this creepy, creepy house because it was cool. supposed to be a haunted house. Yeah. And it was phenomenal. It was one of the best experiences I've ever had. I'm sure. I, I feel like as an actor, it's got to be so fun to get that first kind of fantasy, otherworldly yeah. kind of experience. Absolutely. I, I know a lot of actors say it's really fun to do those kind of roles. And, so, so. and I and I love horror films, so it felt like this like sci-fi horror film thing yeah. we were doing, and it was so cool. Very cool. Yeah. Um, of course, those were some of your you know early roles, but you have <laughs> booked a series regular on a network sitcom. I'm, is, That's real. I know. Um, yeah. Can I hear a little bit about the casting process, the development? I want to hear the full. Yeah. Well. It, it's crazy because so there's a thing called pilot season as you know yeah. where the the networks are trying to cast this pilot and then you hope this pilot gets picked up and becomes a series so for me i've been auditioning and testing for pilots for the five years that i've been here and i've always been so close right. i never got one uh, and then i actually did a movie uh in january to february and then when i finished that i was like i don't need a tv show i made some money i'll be fine right. uh and i carried that attitude going into audition rooms which you know wasn't a desperate attitude but not even a cocky attitude also in the in the extreme other point of it uh and having that confidence was what i guess worked out and you know i, I got the role and we we shot the pilot and it was all just surreal and amazing and then when we found out we got picked up i literally jumped on my bed screaming <laughs> crying my agent was calling me it was it was like the biggest christmas gift you can ever open i'm i'm sure it's interesting you mentioned that you feel like you were able to really exude a confidence in the casting room once mm -hmm. you kind of let go a little bit yeah. and a lot of our listeners are aspiring actors oh, and right. writers and i feel like i've heard that that mm -hmm. you know casting directors can kind of tell if you're kind of green if you sort of have that yeah. so is that do you think advice that you would give to absolutely and it's so easier said than done mm -hmm. because you want to impress them you want to be their friend you want to show them like i'm really good i have all these choices uh i'm the perfect guy for this but that desperation that greenness that goo is what i was told when studying um that kind of freaks them out a little bit they go you know how are you going to be on set are you going to be you know talking to the producers too much you're going to be annoying the stars too yeah. much and for me being like you know whatever i had fun i ad-libbed a lot um and you know the executive producer called me after i accepted the role like I was gonna turn it down, but he, <laughs> no, thank I, you. Yeah. Joel McHale, no, who's I'm that? Good. Who, Joel? Christopher Mintz, Stephen Fry. Yeah. Um, 
and he was like, look, you came in with stuff that we didn't even imagine for this character, and it inspired us to write more. Great. And that was a huge testament to, yeah, you know, Brian Cranston said, the role that's meant for you is meant for you. Mm. You know what I mean? And all the other roles that I, I mean, I've got close to so many big roles that would have been life-changing, but they weren't meant for me. Yeah, I, had, I listened to a great interview. Do you listen to any podcasts? Are you much of a... I don't, but I want to start doing that because I have a buddy who, who runs a podcast. Too. Yeah, there's yeah. Uh, Mark Maron's got a great podcast called mm. WTF. It's an interview series, kind of like this one. One, mm-hmm. And he had actually Vince Gilligan on, speaking of Brian Cranston, oh, nice. who created yeah. Breaking Bad. And he said that, like, you know, the advice I would give to actors is just keep going. Because yeah. he, of course, Aaron Paul as Jesse Pinkman is amazing in that show. Yeah. But Vince Gilligan said that it wouldn't. he didn't even need to audition. It was like literally he walked in the door and he was like, that's Jesse. Wow. And, like, it's that moment when, like, he saw 200 amazingly talented Jesse Pinkmans, maybe yeah. even equally talented, but they just weren't. The role, yeah. you know. So, did you see his test for that on YouTube? I haven't seen it. No, it's amazing. He messes up. Does he? Yeah, and he's like, ah, oh, I'm sorry. Can we go back? <laughs> and it's it's cool too because when you, as an actor, when you're in that situation where all the executives are watching and they're on their thin blackberries, yeah, you know, when you mess up, you're like, oh, crap, it's over. There it it's is. done. Yeah. You know what I mean? But no, they totally let him restart and do it again because I'm sure they were like, this is the guy, so right. we'll give him a break. Yeah, and I've yeah. heard that Vince Gilligan is just unnecessarily kind as someone who's created like really? the darkest show yeah. on TV he's just like <laughs> the, got the biggest heart that's awesome um, cool so you shot the pilot mm-hmm. I'm sure you've got to go through the upfronts you're just waiting you're just waiting then yeah. I'm sure you found out you got that series order and you were just so excited it was crazy we were like me and the cast uh, we were all texting each other like every day to be like have you heard anything mm-hmm. have you heard any gossip because you know on Variety or Deadline or Hollywood Reporter they would talk about like you know we're hearing good things about this show we're not hearing good things about this one this one seems like a favorite right So we were following that, and we weren't hearing anything about our show until, like, the week before we found out. They were like, this looks strong. We were like, oh, my God, this is happening. This is happening. And I remember I walked. I got up out of bed. I walked into the kitchen. I was refreshing Deadline. And then I refreshed, and it said uh, three new comedy series picked up. uh, Joel McHale's Great Indoors, (laughs) uh, Kevin uh, James, Kevin Conway, and Matt LeBlanc's um, Man with a Plan. I looked at it for a second. I was like, no, this isn't real. And then my phone rang, and then it was my agent. And then that's when I just ran and started <laughs> jumping on the bed. And it was it was insane. CBS is a good multicam network, too. You think they Big are. Bang. You think um, yeah. How I Met Your Mother. Mm-hmm. It's a good, I think it's a good place to be for a multicam. I so. mean, I'm not complaining. Hopefully, yeah. It's been, it's been great. And they treat us so well. And they really allow us to you know, have a say in what we're saying, Mm -hmm. which is fantastic. When you work with someone like Aaron Sorkin, an amazing writer, you know, his word is law like in theater. But in this, the writers and the creators, they're all like, you know, whatever you feel more comfortable saying, like if you feel like you would say it like this, let us know. And they're really receptive to that, which has been fantastic. Yeah, how sad? What's how? How many have you guys shot so far? I know we're it hasn't on our yet. eighth episode right now. Okay, so you guys and you feel like audiences are liking it, and it's been fun. Audiences and... have been insane. It's yeah. so because for me, you know, being a millennial, I've never been into watching sitcoms. Mm-hmm. Um, but this show, I read the script and I was like, oh my god, this is really really funny. And then watching the pilot, you know, every other day that I do watch it, uh, it's really really funny. So I'm like, you know, maybe it's because it's me. I'm in it. Like I'm just being really nice to myself. <laughs> I bring my friends to watch it who are the same like they only watch you know the dramas or like the funny quirky comedies and they're like bro I love this show I've had friends come back for just about every episode except for one great like I've always had a friend there and they just they love it they eat it up it's so relatable it's so now yeah so for our listeners talk a little bit about the show what is it what are we about to say uh, Joel McHale, he plays this character named Jack Gordon, who is an adventurer reporter who comes back to the magazine that publishes his work because he's, uh, you know, older and tired and he's an injury. He's like, you know, I'm too old for this. Mm-hmm. And the magazine that makes his, his publishes his articles is all run by millennials and it's now folded and become a digital magazine. So the whole relationship is Jack, you know, not being privy to social media, you know, Facebook, technology, how it is now, and us not really understanding what it is to be outside or, you know, be in the outdoors or, or not, you know, staying in our phones all the time and having the moment and not so much taking pictures all the time. Huh. So it's it's a great, you know, we make fun of Gen X, Gen X makes fun of us. It's really relevant. A kind of battle of the generations kind Absolutely. of Absolutely. Okay. And it's so, everything we say, it's so truthful. And actually our writers are mostly millennials. Mm-hmm. You know, our creators are Gen X, but our writers are, I think, all completely, yeah, the millennial range. Nice. Yeah. So it's fun, man. It's, it's it doesn't feel like work. It feels like we're just playing and cracking jokes with each other and, oh, and sure. making fun of each other. It's so fun. 
Um, yeah. Well, can, so many congratulations on the show. We're all so excited Thank for you, it. Man. Um, Thank you. I mean, Joel McHale, Chris Mintz Plus. It's just going to be. I'm sure in five years we're going to be looking at this show as one of the classics of Whew. this time. So uh, we're excited. Let it be. Um, so. Talking about, you know, the future, who yeah. do you feel like is a dream actor that you would like to work with? So I, I know there's so many, but that's always there's something I like so to ask. so many. Um, can I give you like a top three? Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, Idris Elba. Nice. He's a powerhouse. Uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor, for those of you who don't know, he was the lead in 12 Years a Slave. I was doing some research actor. and someone asked if you were his son. <laughs> I saw that somewhere. <laughs> Low key, <laughs> I would love to play his son, younger yeah. brother. Like I get that a lot that I resemble him, which is, I mean, it's amazing. Oh yeah, uh, he's a phenomenal actor, trained in Shakespeare and everything, which I love Shakespeare also. Nice. So she would tell if you need a son, you know, not in life, but in your next, <laughs> or movie. maybe, or yeah. in life, you know, I'll talk to my parents. We can work something out. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, Denzel Washington. Oh yeah, of course. It's just powerhouse, powerhouse, powerhouse. Those Absolutely. Are, those are my top. Any directors that you'd love to work with? I'm a huge Christopher Nolan fan. Oh, yeah. I think he's a master storyteller. Very interesting stuff and very poignant, you know, from Dark Knight. My gosh. Oh, my gosh, and, yeah. You know, and I was a big fan of Interstellar. I know people are like, it's so long. But just the world that he created and, and, and the whole thing with, with space, it was... It's a great I movie. I thought it was brilliant. Very ambitious. Yeah. You know, you can't argue that Interstellar takes huge risks. Yeah. Which... Any movie that takes a risk, even if it doesn't necessarily pay off, I'm going to be happy with I'm it. Always, because... I'm down for the risk, yeah, man. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Absolutely. But, um, gosh, what else? You know, Memento. Um, Inception's one of my favorites. Inception. It's a wonderful movie. And Leonardo DiCaprio is phenomenal, oh, too. Yeah. He's, okay, top four. Yeah. <laughs> um, top five, Kate Blanchett, six, Meryl Streep. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, I... He's amazing. He would be a dream come true. Have you watched Westworld yet? Chris I Kinnell, haven't. It's good. You know what? This is what I do. When a new show comes out, I wait like four episodes and then I binge it. You know, I'll be Absolutely. like, okay, I'll do four and then I'll like wait for like four more weeks and then I'll binge it or I'll just won't watch it for the entire season. But then everyone's talking about it, so I have to like say well, no, like say goodbye to my friends and stuff, you know. I'll never criticize anyone because I still haven't watched Game of Thrones, so like <laughs> I know I think I'm the only human my being I know. In my LA. <laughs> it's that's an amazing show. And the thing is, like, I know I would like it. Like, it's a perfect show for my girlfriend and I, but we just we haven't. And yeah. I know that probably we're gonna take one week and just watch all of it probably yeah. over Christmas. But I will never criticize anyone for not watching a show because I haven't watched Thrones. So that's I know that's insane. the ultimate. Los Angeles sin that, that I haven't. It, but... Absolutely. I wouldn't repeat that to anyone else. I know, yeah. I'll get shamed <laughs> out of this town. Yeah. Um, and then anyone whose career, I know you mentioned some great actors earlier, but mm -hmm. anyone whose career do you feel like has really influenced you? Will Smith's actually, yeah. um, starting off in a sitcom and then working his way to, you know, the action film realm and then the dramas, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I feel like he's a fantastic actor. You know, Pursuit of Happiness is one of my favorite films. Oh, yeah. where, you know, talks about the, the human spirit and and you know, no matter what anyone says, knowing that you can achieve something great. And him passing it along to his son in that scene is just it's inspiring. But yeah, his the way he orchestrated his career, I would love to model mine after also. Absolutely, man. Well, I think you will. I've got high hopes for you, man, and I really enjoyed our time today. Are we going to become best friends? I think we I are, think we man. are, bro. Absolutely. I think we're best friends. Um, in the meantime, please let everyone know where they can catch The Great Indoors, when it's on, mm. when it's premiering, and what's the time slot, because yes. I'm going to be watching for sure. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you gotta... It's coming up uh, October 27th, 8.30 Eastern, uh, 7.30 Central on CBS, right after The Big Bang Theory. I've, I've heard that's a popular show. I don't know. I mean, I've heard a little bit. <laughs> I heard it smashed a lot of records. I heard it's doing okay. I heard they're getting a million dollars an episode. Um, and then anything <laughs> else in the meantime, besides this show that you want to promote, I mean, I'm sure your series regular your production schedule swamped, but yeah. if you're working on anything else, uh, I'm sure they can follow you on Twitter to catch it. Yeah, yeah. Just follow me at Sean Brown, uh, and I'm always, you know, talking about, I'm kind of a shameless plugger. That's yeah, no, my that's, whole, I'm like that's literally your job. That's I, our job. Well, I just get so. really excited because you know, three years ago, two years ago, I wasn't doing this. Right. You know what I mean? You can go I was catch struggling. me at the restaurant. I know, right? I'll get you I'll water. Get you some really great old fashions and some water with a little bit of spritz. But <laughs> yeah, it's it's an exciting time, man. Yeah, it's of course really exciting. It is. Yeah, and it's well deserved. Thank you. Um, in the meantime, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Jeff Graham. I'm your host for today. Had a blast talking to my new friend Sean Brown. <laughs> If you guys want to see me, you can find me on Twitter at Jeffrey C. Graham, where I'm also at AfterBuzz here. I'm covering Donald Glover's Atlanta as well as Kristen Bell's The Good Place on NBC. Nice. Um, and Sean, 
Of course, you guys can find him on Sean Brown on Twitter. Yes. And guys, it's been a blast. Thank you so much. Follow us both and uh, keep up with us, and we'll see you next time here at Spotlight on an After Buzz TV. From executive producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other after shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz, Buzz you later. later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals. 